We now return to Candy Matson, Yukon 2, 8209, who is investigating the theft of the Japanese Sandman from the gallery of Phyllis Essex. That night, Candy slept fitfully, tossing back and forth between her Egyptian cotton sheets, occasionally pounding her pillow as she tried to sort out all the facts and clues surrounding the Japanese Sandman. Finally, she dropped off to sleep two hours after midnight. But alas, her phone rang just before 3 a.m. Oh, oh, what? What is that? Oh. Oh, oh my goodness. Oh, um, uh, uh, all right. Uh, Yukon 289. No. Uh, Yukon 290. Oh, who the heck is this? And it better be real important. Oops. Did the handsome prince awaken Sleeping Beauty? Ballard, are you suffering from insomnia? Why are you calling me? Sweetie, I'm sorry. Oh. I can just imagine you in bed. Your arms wrapped around your orphan nanny doll, your funny little snow. That's it, Mallard. Talk sense or I yank this phone out of the wall. Okay, okay. I've got good news and bad news. The good news is you can eliminate one of your suspects in the gallery theft. The bad news is that Phyllis Essex is being fished out of the bay, and she's as dead as a mackerel. Oh, that poor woman. How did it happen? Suicide. She drove her new 1950 Cadillac Fleetwood right off a commercial pier near Beery Street into China Basin about midnight. Where are you now, Mallard? I'm still at the pier. A crane pulled the caddy out about half an hour ago, and the crime lab boys are about finished. Her body is en route to the coroner's office for an autopsy, and our forensics team will take the car to the impound lot over on Hooper Street. Wait, wait suicide sounds all wrong. Maybe she was murdered. Oh, so now you're the coroner, too? Tell you what, meet me in my office in four hours, and I'll buy you breakfast and furnish you with a preliminary report, which the San Francisco police will be working on while you finish your beauty sleep. It's a deal, Mallard. I like plain bagels with cream cheese. Yeah, I know. With regular coffee, no cream, two sugars. Your memory is improving. Good night now. Next morning, Mallard was only slightly surprised when I entered his office in homicide at 6.55 a.m. He pushed a paper bag across his desk to me. Inside were two plain bagels, cream cheese, large coffee, and sugar. As I started on my breakfast, he began briefing me. You'll be delighted I was right. Once again, it's plain suicide. Coroner established her lungs were filled with unsanitary bay water. No marks or bruises. Alcohol content minimum. Probably one glass of wine with dinner. Cause of death? Drowning. Probable suicide. Wait a minute. He said probable? Yeah, he did. But he'll drop that adjective when he sees the suicide note. You never told me about any suicide note. I didn't know about that until after I phoned you. Our detectives woke up Dr. Essex about 1 a.m. Poor fellow was all broken up with the news of her death. He told them he had dinner with two doctors from Mercy Hospital and got home around 11.30 p.m. His wife was not home yet, but he wasn't worried as she had told him she was visiting friends in Broadmoor and he was not to wait up. The detective searched the house with Essex and found the suicide note on her dresser. So what did the note say? Cupcake, be patient. I'm coming to that. Basically, she said she had been depressed for months, that she felt responsible for losing the most expensive item in her gallery, and she wanted to end it all. That's nuts. I talked to this woman at length right after the theft. She wasn't depressed, and she felt no responsibility for the loss. If anything, she wavered between unconcern and arrogance. I think that note is a fake. I'll bet you're wrong. The lab boys are going over it right now, and odds are it was typed on her typewriter, it's her signature, and hers are the only fingerprints on it. I'll take that bet. If the suicide note is proven to be hers and hers alone, I'll take you to that Tex Acuff movie. But if it's fake, you have to take me to a moonlit dinner on Fisherman's Wharf. It's a bet, sweetheart, and you're going to love that movie. I'll have the lab report no later than noon. Where can I call you? That's easy. I'll be at Fisherman's Wharf making dinner reservations. I went back to my apartment on Telegraph Hill and tried to reach Dr. Essex at his home and office. He was not at either place. The death of Phyllis had generated a lot of newspaper ink. 
One of the divers was quoted as saying there were three shoes in the vehicle when it was recovered, two on the victim and a third near the brake pedal. About 11.30, I phoned Mallard. Does the lab report say we're going to Fisherman's Wharf tonight? No, Cupcake. The suicide note was genuine. Lab confirmed it. It was typed on her typewriter, on her stationery, and is her signature, not a forgery. They also found seven latent fingerprints, both whole and partial, and every one is out of Phyllis Essex, and there were no other fingerprints on the note or the envelope. Okay, so she wrote the note. What about the extra shoe in her car? Doesn't that bother you a little? It does not. The forensic report also shows two purses, both belonging to her, were also recovered. Maybe she just wanted to take everything with her. You mean she goes to ma meet her maker carrying two purses and wearing three shoes? No woman would do that. Come on, Candy. People who commit suicide are not in a normal state. Who cares about the extra shoe? Maybe it was in her car for days. Maybe she picked it up from a shoe repair place and forgot it was in the car. And two purses are not significant. Anyway, you lose the bet. Her note is legit. So pick me up at 7 p.m. for that great Western movie. Friends, do your cigarettes cause coughing and throat irritation? Then it's time to switch to Old Golds. Medical experts l report that Old Golds are the safest, healthiest cigarettes you can light up. Listen to Dr. Dabney Essex of San Francisco. To preserve your health or the, your throat, choose Old Golds every time. And that way you'll also enjoy the great flavor and refreshing mildness. So, pick up a carton of Old Golds today and light up the cigarette that doctors recommend. Remember, there's never a cough in a carload. I'm going to turn north on Larkin. There's a pay lot on Polk near the theater. Now, tell me again about that third shoe, Mallard. What's to tell? The shoes on her feet were navy blue pumps. The third one was a beige high heel, probably a gift, since it had her initials inside the heel. And those two purses. Were the contents identical? Yeah, almost. So don't worry your pretty little head about them. Both purses contain comb, compact, lipstick, cough drops, handkerchief, fingernail file, etc. Only difference was that one purse had her driver's license and charge cards, while the other did not. That's very interesting, don't you think? So what about insurance? Did Phyllis carry life insurance? Yes, she did. They were both insured for $250,000, with all money going to the surviving spouse as sole beneficiary. Now we're getting somewhere. But don't most insurance policies have an anti-suicide clause? I mean, no one can collect if the victim commits suicide. Yes, and these policies did also. But those clauses generally expire in a stated period, usually two or three years after the policy is issued. In this case, the policy was issued in 1947, and that clause expired five months ago. So, the doc has 250 grand to comfort him in his sorrow. How convenient for Dr. Jekyll and his Mrs. Hyde. Does that coincidence not raise the suspicion hackles on the back of your neck? Look, sweetie, not every sudden death is neat, tidy, and free of loose ends. I've got nine pending homicide cases right now, and I don't need to turn an ordinary suicide into a murder because of an extra shoe, purse, or routine insurance payout. I'm not saying it had to be murder, but I'm a suspicious gal. Did you know that Dr. Essex was romancing his nurse, Yvette Monet? Who cares, Candy? Last time I checked, there was not a violation of the California Penal Code for Dr. Essex's nurse. You're missing the point, Mallard dear. His nurse could be the motive for sending dear Phyllis to the great beyond. <sighs> Why is it every time we're on a date, we end up sounding like Nick and Nora Charles? Actually, they're on a different network. We watched the movie with Tex Acuff and his Wonder Horse Mustard, which had all the elements of Hollywood's real West. There was a stampede, a foiled hanging, a stagecoach plunging into a river after a robbery, and plenty of cowboy songs, plus gunfights, in which six guns fired dozens of shots without reloading. Mallard loved it. I enjoyed the popcorn. <laughs> The next day, Candy called the telegraph office to send a message. After lunch, she was attired in an ice blue dress with a single strand of pearls and awaiting a visitor who arrived at 2 p.m. 
Good afternoon, Dr. Essex. Thank you for coming. Your telegram said you had solved the case and requested me to meet you here. Please tell me what you've learned. I shall, but first, may I fix you a drink? Yes, uh, please, uh, bourbon and soda. All right, I'll have the same, on the rocks. Here you are, doctor. Can I get you anything else? No, but I'm very anxious to hear about the solution of the case. Have you recovered the Japanese Sandman? Almost. You see, it ties in with your wife's murder. You mean suicide. Well, it was supposed to look like suicide, but... I'm sorry, would you excuse me, doctor? Hello, Yukon 28209. Hello, dear one. You asked me to call you at 2.07 p.m., so here I am, as punctual as Peter Pan. Yes, Lieutenant Mallard, I understand completely. No, you don't understand. It's not that stuffy policeman. It is myself, Rembrandt Watson. That's what I thought, Lieutenant. Were you able to confirm my theory on the Essex case? Oh, so that's it. You're bluffing someone, so it doesn't matter what I say. Fine. Candy had a little lamb whose bottom was white as snow. That's good. So, you have Yvette Monet in custody now? A focal plane shutter incorporates a black shade with a movable, variable-sized slit which moves across the exposed film. And she's confessed to the whole plot of killing Mrs. Essex and staging a fake suicide? A saucy young wench from Nantucket. So Yvette told you where the Japanese Sandman was hidden? That's enough, Matson. This gun is loaded, so hang up on that meddling cop right now. Goodbye, Lieutenant. Matson, it appears you've solved your last case. Now I'm going to put a bullet between your pretty blue eyes. Why not just throw me off my balcony? It's 20 stories down, and that would give you enough time to write my suicide note, just like you did your wife's. Actually, the stupid cow wrote her own note. Phyllis was in on my plot to fake her suicide and get the pro proceeds from the Japanese Sandman and the insurance money. She thought I would be joining her in Costa Rica as soon as the insurance company paid off. Only she never suspected that you were really going to send her to the bottom of the China Basin. And after a suitable grief period, fly off with the vet to Paris, I'm assuming? Close. We were planning on Normandy. We could rent a small cottage there and start converting our dollars to francs. But we were, wa were wasting time, Matson. Oh, look behind you. There's a handsome policeman standing there. You disappoint me, Matson. That's the oldest trick in the book, and I... Ah, 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 ah. Mallard had stripped the small automatic from the doctor's hand and pulled both of his arms behind him and as he placed the handcuffs on his wrist. Two uniformed police entered it from the bedroom and escorted him out of the apartment. Take him to central booking, boys. Okay, Candy. You told me if I hid behind that screen this afternoon, Essex would arrive and confess the whole plot. So who was on the phone? Watson, I'm guessing. Yes, it was. And I'll tell you all the rest of the details after our moonlit dinner at Fisherman's Wharf tonight. After dinner that night at DiMaggio's Grotto Restaurant, Candy and Mallard took their drinks out on the terrace. So, what made you suspect the good doctor? Well, he and his wife were at odds from the beginning. He seemed so concerned over the theft, and she wasn't. When I found out he was romancing his nurse and piling up gambling debts, I figured he might want to kill two birds with one suicide. The Japanese Sandman was valuable, but not worth killing over, so I thought it might just be a cover-up for another crime more lucrative. So, Essex gets his wife to believe that they are going to fake her suicide, collect big bucks, and retire to a beach in Costa Rica. They disconnect the alarm, steal the Japanese Sandman, and then stage the suicide. Only, it's not a rehearsal for her. It's the final Kirk. Right you are. But to fake her suicide with no body found in the car, they had to improvise. So they planted the purse and the shoe with her initials so they would be found when the caddy was examined. But when they got to the pier, he probably couldn't think of a way to retrieve them without raising her suspicions. I suppose he got her in the car on a pretext. Maybe to get fresh fingerprints on the steering wheel. With the engine running, he could reach over, shift the gears, sending the Cadillac off the pier into China Bay. She couldn't swim a stroke, so she was a goner when she hit the water. What tipped you to the significance of the extra person's shoe? I hate to admit it, but it was your Tex A cuff movie. 
Remember when they decided that the old prospector must have been in the stagecoach when it went in the river, even though they couldn't find his body? Why? Because they found his pouch of gold nuggets in the stage. What better proof that Phyllis was in the car than finding her purse and initial chew? Well, you guessed right on the hiding place of the Japanese Sandman. It was in Yvette's apartment. Doc couldn't take a chance on hiding it in his home or his office. They were going to double their take on that urn. First, collect from the insurance company for its loss, and then sell it in France when news of the theft had evaporated. Yeah, well, soon both the doctor and his nurse will be enjoying the hospitality of the California Prison Administration for a long time. Ah, Margo, the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. You're right, Lamont. But right now, it's just me and my shadow. Kitten, this is a wonderful evening. Mallard, dear, it's always a wonderful evening when I end up in the long arms of the law. You have been listening to Candy Matson, Yukon 28209, written by Jack French, based on characters created by Monty Masters. This program was produced by Sally Stevens and directed by Jack French. Candy Matson was played by Sally Stevens, Rembrandt Watson by Michael Hayde, Lieutenant Mallard by Dennis Roma, Dr. Essex by Lawrence Kondrak, Phyllis Essex and the Waitress by Marsha Bush, Sergeant Carter by Mark Bush, Madam Chang by Myra Hayde, sound effects by Marcia and Mark Bush. This is your announcer, Dennis Stevens. This program originally came to you from the NBC studios in San Francisco. And welcome back to another edition of Potluck, your everything and anything talk and entertainment TV show. My name is Laura Hartman and I'm your host. And you just watched The Japanese Sandman by Jack French, who probably looks familiar because he's been on our show before for the Washington Metropolitan or the Metropolitan Washington Old Time Radio Club. So welcome back, Jack. Glad to be here. Um, what we just watched is amazing and, and you, you wrote this yourself. Uh, I, I did uh, because there are no uh, scripts that are available from this Candy Matson series. Okay. They're all in uh, in the custody of the Thousand Oaks Library, and they won't uh, provide any copies to the public. But they're just being super cautious, I guess. Okay. Okay. So, um, so what made you pick this topic? Or I mean, like an urn, you know. <laughs> Getting well, stolen. It's, a, it's a combination of several things. First of all, uh, Candy Matson was one of the best of the radio's lady detectives, and there weren't that many on the air, perhaps two dozen. And of course, there were at least a hundred male detectives on sure, the air. Sure, sure. She's the one that you talked about on our last show. I mean, when we when we had our interview before. Yes. That's correct. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the show was a, a combination of a married couple, Monty Masters, who wrote the scripts and directed the shows and Natalie Park, who uh, starred in the lead of it. Okay. And it was on uh, San Francisco, uh, on NBC, but it was only on the West Coast. It was a regional show. So not too many people of your viewers have probably heard of it. Okay. So um, did they ever do anything with TV with her? I mean, like, I, I haven't heard any, yeah. the name. They I have, mean, that, that name. Yeah, they, they had audition, but, but it never went anywhere. And the, and the show was in that awkward period between radio at its crest and TV coming in. Uh, a lot of shows went off the air in 1950, of course, in that era because advertising dollars were switching from radio right. to TV. Right. And this show couldn't stay on the air because they couldn't find a sponsor. Okay. So when you're writing this, and I know you've been doing this for quite a while with yes, the old-time yeah. radio, um, we're sitting at the, the sound table. Yes. <laughs> it's got a bunch of little fun sound toys and stuff. Um, so how do you decipher when to add in those sounds when you're writing? Or do you, like, when you're writing, do you think of, like, these are the sounds I want to add, so this is what I'm going to write? Uh, it can be both. Uh, usually you just let the story dictate what sound effects are necessary, uh, and that includes both manual sound effects which is probably 75% of what we heard on radio. Okay. And then the ones that come off a record or a tape or something like that, uh, 
which we have to do when we perform our shows as far as music and things that you can't create on a table, like an automobile engine running, right. uh, cannon fire, oh, etc. Sure. Right, okay. So what, tell us um, about some of the, the cast that you, that you have. Um, sure. Well, I use the same characters that Monty Masters used. In other words, uh, they had the lead of Candy Matson, who's a private eye, lives mm -hmm. on Telegraph Hill. Uh, her boyfriend is uh, Lieutenant Mallard of the San Francisco Police Department. And her best friend and confidant is Rembrandt Watson. Okay. And of course, most people would pick up on the fact that she's got a friend named Watson, the same as Sherlock Holmes did. Ah, okay, <laughs> yeah. So, so we use pretty much the same uh, char three characters revolving around, in this case, a murder mystery. Okay. Now, and the people, who are the people that are playing those parts? Well, we, we use uh, our own members of mm -hmm. the Metropolitan Washington Old Time Radio Club. Uh, most of the people that direct our shows uh, either know who they want for a part, or if it's a decision between two or three, we'll let them audition for the parts. Okay. And we're just trying to get, of course, the person who sounds the most like we think the person in the script is supposed to sound like. Okay, okay. And the people that are actually playing these parts, that pl just played these parts today, what are their names? Yes, well, uh -huh. uh, at, the, at the very beginning of the show, we've got the lead, uh, Candy Matson, mm -hmm. who's played by Sally Stevens. And uh, her father, Dennis Stevens, is our announcer. Oh, okay. And then uh, the married couple, uh, Dr. Essex and his wife, uh, are played by Lawrence Kondrak, mm -hmm. and uh, Marsha Bush, who's doing double duty because she's also part of our sound effects right. team. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> she's got it. It was an interesting voice, too, yes. that she was using. And then we have another married couple uh, in the cast, uh, mm -hmm. Michael Hayde and his wife, Myra. Uh, he plays Rembrandt Watson, and she plays Madame Chang. Okay, very cool. So when you, um, back to when you're like casting people for these roles, mm -hmm. um, do you try to get people with like the most, you know, some people have like radio voices or just like, you know, they sound really good on audio. Um, do you like look for that when you're looking for people or are you, or are you going more with the character? Um, both, actually. I mean, you have okay. to sound like the character, but you have to sound good on radio, too. So uh, it's a combination of those two qualities. And the other quality, of course, is somebody that's able to do this show with a minimum number of rehearsals. Okay. Uh, harking back to network radio, they generally had just two rehearsals before they went live on network radio. Wow. There'd be a, there'd be a first rehearsal, and then the second rehearsal, they added the sound effects, and the third one they went. But and they but they have a script that they could have in front of them. Absolutely, for, yeah. absolutely. Okay. And, and that was a problem, of course, for the radio people in the 1950s who were expected to come on a TV show ah, where they didn't have a script. Right, they had to right. memorize their lines. There were no teleprompters. Sure. And uh, it, it, was, it was death for some performers, particularly if they're on a daily show, like a soap opera was on every day, uh -huh. and they had to memorize perhaps 20 pages of dialogue this night to right. perform the next. And uh, all the shows were done live. They weren't taping them then at first. Sure. So it was a real test of, of your memorization skills mm -hmm. to make that transition from a radio actor to a TV actor. Wow. So back, you know, going back in time when they had the radio shows, did you ever go on set? To, uh, did you ever see any live radio I, shows I, yourself? I, I did not. Unfortunately, I was stuck up in the north woods of Wisconsin, okay. and all we had was one tiny little radio station there. They never did any dramatic programs or comedies. The nearest one would have been uh, Milwaukee. But uh, it was fairly common to invite the audience in for these shows. In fact, Candy Matson was done before a live audience. Oh, wow. Now, you never hear the audience because that live audience was behind a, a, a window that was soundproof. So you could see the cast and hear the cast, but no sound of, from the cast. Or, they couldn't hear the audience. They couldn't hear the audience at all, yeah. Oh, wow. So the, 
the actress that played Candy Matson, um, who was she? She was uh, Natalie Park, and uh, the show actually started off as about a male detective. Mm -hmm. Monty Masters had written this uh, new detective show called Candy Matson, and they were auditioning it for his mother-in-law. And she said, Monty, you've got a hundred male detectives on radio already. Right. Time for a female. Why don't you give the part to Natalie and you concentrate on writing and directing? And it was an excellent suggestion. And, th and that's exactly what they did. Wow. So with her character, does she always have those really interesting comments to say, you know? Yeah, she's, <laughs> she... <laughs> There's, there's not only some cute comments that she has with everybody she interviews, but that interplay between her and her boyfriend, Mallard, is not flirtatious so much as teasing. Okay. Uh, for one thing, she never calls him by his first name. She always calls him Mallard. Uh, and he usually calls her something like cupcake or kitten. Right. And um, so it's not strictly flirtatious at all. It's more of a a teasing back and forth between a couple who obviously admire each other a great deal right. and enjoy the company. And of course, he has the disadvantage on radio that even if they're working the same case, which they do often, she solves it before he does. Oh, oh okay, <laughs> very cool. So um, how long has the, the, the Metropolitan Washington Old Time Radio Club been in, in in, in existence. Yeah. Uh, we were formed in uh, 1984. Okay. Started off with five members uh, in the basement of one of the members' houses. And uh, now here it is, 2017. We've got over 100 members oh, wow. and they're scattered throughout the United States. We've got members in 17 different states. Now, obviously, they can't attend our monthly meetings, right. but they get the newsletter. Uh, which is Radio Recall every other month. Uh -huh. And then they also get an electronic bulletin called Gather Around the Radio by email on those other months. Okay, very cool. Well, thank you so much. We've um, run out of time. So if you're just tuning in, make sure you catch us on the web at www.potluck-online.org. So thank you again. Thank you. And we will see you next time. All right.